All right, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a nice sunny morning of chemistry, Chem 1211, with your host, Dr. White, laboratory included today. All right, a couple things. First of all, I'll be going through problem set chapter three. Let me remind all of you, don't forget, Monday I'll be doing chapter four and I'll also do my world famous review for the next test, test number one. So please show up, it will help. Uh, another thing today, I'm gonna to be doing an, a social experiment with all of you. I tried it yesterday in my other class at ECC, Elgin Community College, and it worked out pretty good. We'll be going to, you'll be going to, and so will I, to breakout rooms after we do the lab and you'll get to meet your colleagues, which I think is a good thing. Because one of the bad things about, I wouldn't say bad, the missing things about being online is you don't get to know some of your colleagues. If we were at face-to-face -face at COD, we'd be a, in a lecture and you could talk to people before and after lecture. And we'd be in a lab and you talk to people during and before and after the lab. And you get to talk to me too and I get to talk to you. But online like this, that hasn't happened. Well, I'm going to see if I can make it happen or help it happen. So uh, reminder, don't forget today the density lab is due. Make sure you upload it sometime today. Uh, there was a common misconception for problem number four, and that was in the problem I had liquid lead and you're putting things in and see if it floats or sinks. And if you look at the table four, they only had solid, I only put down solid lead. Let's assume that liquid lead and solid lead have the same density. I'm sure they're pretty close, but assume for that problem. Some people, well, how can you put it in a liquid if it says solid here? Well, guess what? You have change of state. You have things can melt or they can be made into liquid. And just like water, water, well, I'm not gonna give away the question number five answer for density. All right, let's get going. All right, everybody see chapter three practice problem set number one on their screen? Yes, thank you. By the way, has the clicking problem gone away? You no longer hear, yep, I solved it for good. Yay, Dr. White. All right, let's do this. Let's go through this. And these are questions you should know how to answer. They're called practice problems. And after test number one, you'll understand why I call them practice problems. All right, number one, what's one of the four main branches of chemistry? Well, the best is organic, but Dr. White's an organic chemist, but also you could put down inorganic, physical, analytical. What's matter? Anything that occupies space and has mass. All right, real important. What are the three states of matter? Solid, liquid, gas. You should know solid, definite shape, definite volume, liquid, definite volume, indefinite shape, gas, indefinite shape, indefinite volume. Hint, you should know that. Oh, it's subtle Thursday. Let's do it again. Everybody, what's the three states of matter? Solid, liquid, and gas. And if you're breathing right now, which I hope you all are, you're inhaling a gas. And my tea, blueberry, as always, second cup. Oh, is that good? It's a liquid. And this pen is a solid.
Now, we talked about pure substances and name a sub pure substance that you could use in your life or you do use in your life. And there are many things, water, gold, oxygen, nitrogen, gas, and the list goes on and on and on. Name a mixture that you could purchase at the local grocery store. Well, milk is a mixture. If you buy mouthwash, which I get mine at Walmart, which is, I guess they sell groceries at mine too. Pop, I uh, should mention Dr. White's from Chicagoland and the stuff that's in a bottle or can that's carbonated, non-alcoholic, we call pop, not soda. Mustard, ketchup is a mixture. There are tons of things. Now, we talked about homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homogeneous mixture is the same throughout. Heterogeneous is not the same throughout. And therefore, question number six, is oil, vinaigrettes, salad dressing, homogeneous or heterogeneous? And the answer is heterogeneous. Why? They're two layers. Oh, excuse me. They're two layers. If you've ever had a bottle of oil vinaigrette dressing, my mother used to love wishbone. I wasn't that big on I can make it myself better. But anyways, you shake it up, put it on your salad, put the bottle down. What happens? It separates and immediately you know that's heterogeneous. Now, next one is gasoline. You probably have looked at it, but you better hope that the gasoline you buy at a local gas station is homogeneous, the same throughout. Gasoline is a very complex mixture of many different things. Now, I asked you, and I've been doing commercials, and hopefully you've been do, uh, doing your job, that you should learn the chemical symbols, both the name and the symbol. And the green uh, periodic table is the one you should be using for test number one, two, three, four, and the final. And I'll be giving that as a download if you already haven't when I put test number one in the assignment area. But if I ask you on a test, give the chemical symbol, my favorite, carbon C, gold AU, oxygen O, sodium, that should be NA. It is, but S and A. You should know how to do those. And plus the other ones. If I ask one or two points, give the name of an element with the following symbol, Na sodium, Br bromine, my favorite again, carbon as C, yeah, I planned that, and Mg magnesium, gold, argon. And remember, unless I was kidnapped to another universe, in our universe, in our world, Krypton is not a green solid that kills Superman, but a colorless gas. All right, next I talked about chemical and physical properties. And a physical property is something that you observe and in the, uh, would be not something that tells you how something changes chemically. So in a physical property, whatever you're observing does not change chemically. In a chemical property, it will, or has this pertensity, ooh, big 25 cent word there, to change. So water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. And what is that, chemical or physical property? Eh, physical property. Iron can rust. Is that a physical or chemical property? And the answer is chemical property. Why? Because that shows you the ability or the propensity of iron to undergo change, chemical change, because rust is not iron. Rust is also known as ferric oxide. That's where the oxygen reacts in the air with the iron. Now, something you should know how to do if we look at number 15. And by the way, while I'm going through there, if you have a question, ask. Either turn on your mic or ask it in chat. Because as you know, there's no such thing as a dumb question in my universe. 
for those who were at my office hour, which was amazing last night. We had a full party last night you missed. Uh, every time somebody would come in, the favorite question was about question four on density. I think I answered it four or five times. And each time it was a good question for that person. All right, you should know how to give an example of a physical change. A physical change is when you have a change of state. Water boiling, ice melting. In a physical change, the chemical or substance you're looking at does not change its chemical identity. All right. Time to make you think too. Why don't you think about what would be an example of a physical change that you would like to, that you're thinking of? Your turn. If you want, put it in the chat. Let's see how many different physical changes. I see one person's got a good one. Come on, people. Water evaporating. I'll teach you later on about how, what happens and why it happens when men sweat, women perspire. I guess chopping up would be a physical change if you cut up something like celery. I'm not sure what an oil diffuser is when you say that. Is that something that vaporizes oil? Okay, then that would be a uh, physical change. Uh, another one would be, let's see, a physical change if you boil water. I think I already mentioned that. And, um, ooh, here's a good one. How many of you in this kind of real cold weather take a nice hot shower or bath and you get out if you don't have a very good exhaust fan on or you forgot to turn on and you look at the mirror or if you have a window in your bathroom, it's all covered with a liquid. It's fogged up. And that's, guess what? That is a physical change. The water in the air, how do you like my little demonstration of water, is in a gas phase, we call that water vapor, and it condenses on the cold mirror, and then it becomes a liquid phase. And that's condensation. I guess breaking glass would be an example. And so you all come up with some good ideas. I don't know if I've said this before, but when you're not in my class, you can still think of chemistry. Chemistry is all around us. I stole that from SpongeBob. For those of you who remember the episode where he said, imagination, when they're playing with a box. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we played with boxes, made them into spaceships and everything. But seriously, chemistry is all around you. All you have to do is look in the mirror. My hair is chemistry. My skin is what's left of my hair, at least, is. And it's all around you. All right, now a chemical change, an example, is when something changes its chemical identity. And an example would be if you burn a candle, the wax is being converted into carbon dioxide and water. That's called combustion. Next time you eat, if you the breakfast you ate, assuming you ate breakfast, when you swallow it after you chew it, by the way, personal story, when I was about two or three, my mother used to tell me, chew your food well before you eat, swallow, or you'll choke. Guess what? I found out she wasn't lying to me. One time I did choke. Oh, by the way, yes, I survived, in case you were wondering about that. But when you chew your food and swallow it, do what your mother tells you. I didn't. I learned the hard way not to. And it goes into your stomach it's undergoing a chemical change. I hate to break this to you, but you're a walking chemical factory. All throughout your body, chemical changes are occurring, but some of the biggest are in your stomach where the acid in there breaks your food down 
and so other things that your body can then use. If you're taking organic chemistry with me, which I teach at Elgin Community College, I teach that chemistry. It's quite exciting. Also, Dr. White has worked in certain industries like fats and oils, so I know firsthand about that. And iron rusting would be another example. Let's try and have you think of an example of a chemical change. I'll give you one, probably today or tomorrow, I'll build a nice fire in my fireplace because the weather is just right for a good fire. And the wood burning is undergoing a chemical change. Well, I already did digestion, so can you think of another one, everybody? Yep, rotting food, <laughs> but you're right. Nobody put down, <laughs> never mind, I don't even want to say it. That's true. When you step on your accelerator or start your car up, the gasoline is undergoing a chemical change in your car engine. Decomposition, that's true. Any others? Come on, two more. You can do it. That would be a chemical change when sodium you put into water explodes, which it will. Ooh, maybe I'll have time today to show you something. Fermentation. Cooking is, you forget about it, but cooking is a chemical change. When you cook eggs or bake a cake or other things, now I'm getting hungry, <laughs> make hot dogs, uh, all sorts of good things that I shouldn't be doing. All right, let's move on. Now, what state of matter has definite shape, definite volume? A solid. If I were to ask an unknown sample that you can't see has indefinite shape and indefinite volume, what state of matter is that? And the answer is a gas. And also I have state of matter, indefinite shape, indef and uh, what state of matter has indefinite shape, definite volume, a liquid. Ooh, that made me think of something I hadn't thought about in eons. When I was a senior in high school, I was taking advanced uh, chemistry, college chemistry course, and Dr. not Dr. Mr. Solner's great teacher, uh, I'm sure he's long gone now, but uh, sad but true. One of the experiments they had us do early in the semester was each student was given a box and there was something in the box and you had to identify things about whatever that was in the box and like what state of matter was it in? You could shake, oh, it's a solid or it's a liquid. Was it magnetic, other things? And it was quite a challenging experiment. I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, a number of us got medals and what shape was it? And you were given a magnet and iron filings to try and help determine the shape. And it was an exciting experiment. So if you have any kids at home, put something in a box and ask them to figure out what it is without opening the box. Hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully you don't have any x-ray machines at home. <laughs> I doubt most people do. All right, let's go to the second practice problem part for chapter three, which is temperature. Now, before we do that, let me remind you a couple of formulas.
All right, thumbs up, people. Can you see the whiteboard, the three formulas? Thank you. All right, in the past, I would ask students to memorize this. Good news, you don't have to. These three will be an important information on the last page of test number one, but you do have to know how to use that. Let's look at the first one, this right here. Remember 1.8 and 32 are exact numbers and they do not play a role in how many significant figures your answer is. Therefore, whatever the number of significant figures you're given C should be how many significant figures your answer should have. This one now, let's call this A, B, and C. We look at formula B, degree C equals degrees F minus 32 times divided by 1.8. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned up here, you do the multiplication before you do the addition. On test, I often see on this one, students do divide degrees F by 1.8, divide 32 by 1.8, then subtract those two numbers. That's wrong. You do what's in the bracket first, take degrees F and subtract 32, and then divide by 1.8. And remember, as in above, 32 is an exact number. 1.8 is an exact number. It's part of a formula. Therefore, only degrees F will decide or determine how many significant figures your answer will have, degree C. Finally, Calvin equals degree C plus 273. And this is an addition. And even if it wasn't, this is an exact number. And this will determine how many significant figures to the right of the decimal, because it's an addition, you'll get. So that's how you use those three formulas. You will be given those, so you don't have to memorize them. Thank you, Dr. White. You're welcome. And if we look at the first one, now one of the things I like to do when I solve a problem is determine what am I given, what am I trying to find? Again, one of the things Dr. White likes to do, and I've taught my students, and it's worked well for them, is read the problem and then put down in your paper, what are you trying to find and what are you given? So if we look at number one, and let me, everybody see uh, pro practice problem temperature on there? Thank you. And if we look at number one, we'll see if the temperature of liquid is 134 degrees C, what's the temperature in Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit? So I don't know where I developed it, but I put a question mark that tells me what am I trying to find? And then that's degrees F. Then underneath, what am I given? Well, only this number. Once I have this, I don't have to look up here again. So now I know, oh, I use this formula. Degrees F is 1.8 times degrees C plus 32. I put that in there. And this is three significant figures. My answer is three significant figures. And number two is the same way. Ooh, let's look at number three. If your oven is 353.5 degrees F, got a real nice digital readout. What's the temperature oven in degrees C, Celsius? And again, I like using question mark degrees C. That's what I'm trying to find. Next, what am I given? This temperature in Fahrenheit. So if I want to go from Fahrenheit to degrees C, Celsius, I use this formula. Degrees F minus 32 divided by 1.8. Now, Dr. White was trying to get outside of his three significant figure rut, and I did. Here's degrees F, and the nice thing about having this here is you know what to put where. Here's degrees F, I put it in there. 
subtract 32 first, then divide by that. Notice this number is four significant figures. My answer is four significant figures. When you do it on a calculator, you have to round off and know how to do that. And I've taught you that already. Now, if we look at number five, the temperature of a gas is 303 degrees Celsius. What's the temperature of the gas in Kelvin? And here, what are we trying to find? And again, I like to identify what am I being asked to find unit wise? Degrees K, or not degrees K, shame on Dr. White. This is Kelvin. I always want to do that all my life, but it's an absolute scale, so it's not degrees. And here we have Kelvin. We're trying to find, we're given degrees C Celsius. And the formula, which you should know how to use, is Kelvin equals degrees C plus 273. You pop it in there. And notice this is zero significant figures past the decimal. And my answer is the same. Now, on six, it's a trick. If the temperature out of a liquid is this 101.5 degrees C, then what's the temperature in Kelvin? I'm trying to find Kelvin. I'm given degree C. Here's the formula. Add it. Addition, the number of significant figures past the decimal is the one that's the lowest, is the same as the answer. Well, this is an exact number. Therefore, this should be one past the decimal, and there it is. On the left, you never round off on addition. And that's that. Any questions about chapter three? Remember, after you leave today, think about is something a solid, liquid, or gas? Is it a physical chemical change? All those sort of things. It's all around you chemistry, and it won't hurt to think about it. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Does that work? I am a chemist well, at one company. There are a couple of workers, and when I go to a chemical plant, or actually work at the chemical plant, we had our research and development, and a couple of the workers, I don't know if they even had high school educations. So they knew their job well, and when I, started working at that company. They used to this, everybody called me Doc. And one time one of the workers, Doc, I don't feel well. I have a pain here, what should I do? I said, I'm a chemist, not a medical doctor. I would go to your doctor. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. That same company, another worker came to me and said, Doc, my spleen is hurting me. I said, your spleen's not there. It's over there. You should feel better now. He said, oh, thank you. And he walked away. <laughs> he was trying to get my permission to go home. <laughs> no, you asked your boss. All right, any questions? Going once, going twice. It's time to do lab. And today's lab, you don't even have to use lab Z. I did have you look at it just for a second. Let's take a look real quick. All right, does everybody see titrations, calorimetry, and everything on your screen? Thank you. This you do not have to do, but I just want to show you this lab.
And here, this is one of the calorimeter labs. And yeah, you could do it, but where's the calorimeter? Ah, did I pick the wrong one? Hold on. Oh, thank you. I missed it. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. Let's do that again. This is one I haven't practiced because I tried it. Thank you. All right, this is a calorimeter. You can open it up. These things cost about five to ten thousand dollars. Guess what? We don't have any at COD like that, at least labs I've taught, or in Elgin Community College. So maybe you didn't see that. Let's go back to this. Dr. White, we're stuck on the home screen for Beyond Lab Z. Were you there one sec? All right. Does everybody see the lab now? This right here, where it says bomb. Oh, run away. No. But anyways, this is a calorimeter. These things, and I'll close it. Oh, is that cute? Costs about five to ten thousand dollars. You're not going to see that in an undergrad lab. And even I rarely see them in graduate school uh, in research labs, unless you're doing that. And in reality, what you use is something else. And let's get to that. Let me get out of here. Hopefully you could see it when I changed over. But anyways, let's go to today's lab. All right, everybody see calorie on nut on their screen now? You see it? Yes. All right. You should see the lab calorie on a nut. Everybody see that? Okay, thank you. Don't scare me, people out there. All right, now, when we talk about calories, like things like, oh, you shouldn't eat that. That's high in calories. Unfortunately, all the stuff Dr. White loves is that way, like potato chips, Doritos, uh, a blooming onion, from, all those are high in calorie. But anyways, what's a calorie? It's a measure of heat or energy. And one heat scale, like I said, is calories. In today's lab, you'll do calorie of a nut. Uh, when we, when we started teaching this many years ago at ECC, interesting side story, uh, there have just been a lot of news uh, reports about students or people with allergies to nuts. And the before, week before we were going to do this lab, I raised the question to the faculty, chemistry faculty at ECC, what happens if I have a student who's got a, cal a nut? Uh, allergy or is allergic to nuts. And that can be very lethal in some people. Well, it turned out I asked before, I, uh, after I asked that question, the next time in class, I asked that class and turned out I had two people who were very allergic to nuts. So we couldn't do that. And we thought about it and we found out Frito-Lay's uh, work, uh, this is good. Uh, different types of potato chips or corn chips 
uh, Frito-Lay corn chips work real good. Now, how do you measure heat of certain things when it reacts with oxygen? The heat given off is a flame, and a flame can heat water. And if you look at the amount of water that's heated and the difference in your starting and final temperature of that water when something underneath is burning and heating that flame is called delta T. Delta means difference in chemistry. This is Greek letter delta, capital delta. Can be used to calculate the heat given off in a nut or any other food in a calorimeter. They do it uh, in a controlled environment. In a lab at a teaching school like ours, you're not going to have equipment like that. So you do it by how much water changes temperature. Now, this is called calorimetry. And cal, as you saw, they can be very expensive and cost up to tens of thousands of dollars. But you'll be using an empty pop can if you were in COD. Now, the difference in temperature, the difference in the starting and final temperature is called delta T. Now, Water has so all substances, but all liquids. Water has what's called a heat capacity. That's how much energy it takes to heat a gram of water one degree C. And this will allow you to calculate calories in a nut. Now, let's do this. Let's all watch this video. Uh, hang in there. It's from YouTube, and you can go back at your leisure and watch it. Let me get out of here first. Hold on, helps if I turn on Oh, it helps if I turn on my speaker. <laughs> away from the base of your can, so make sure to measure that. You're going to need 100 milliliters of water that you will pour into your can. Everybody see the video? The water temperature is what you will be recording initially and then after the food source has burned. Go ahead and place a thermometer into the can and let the thermometer adjust to the temperature. While it adjusts, I'm going to take the mass of my food source, which is a peanut. The mass of my peanut is 0.5 grams. You need to record that into your data table. I'll give you that the data. The temperature of the water in my can is 24 degrees Celsius. Wow, it's pretty warm. Very carefully place your food source onto the pin. We use a bent paper clip. And then you need to start your food source on fire. I'm going to use a candle to do this because it does take some time to start the food source burning. Oh, it's a chemical change going Be very on. Very careful with matches. Once the food source has caught on fire and is burning, I will go ahead and place it under the can with the water in it. She should hold so the flame the lower. Can be recorded. You'll start to hear some little um, kind of clicking when it starts to burn. That is a little uh, indication to you, um, like kind of popping that the food source is on fire on its own. You're going to let that burn and heat up the water. Now that the peanut is completely burnt, you're going to check your ending temperature on your thermometer. For the data for the peanut, you're going to record a temperature of 33.5 degrees Celsius. You will be conducting this lab with three other food sources. We're only going to do one.
friends would walk up to me and just be like, what the fuck is in your mug? Sorry about that. <laughs> That's a bad thing. All right. Let me. All right, let me check again. Everybody see the lab now? Good, thank you. All right, now this video, which I won't show you, shows you how to do calculations in case you're interested, but I'll show you now. First of all, you'll use the following formula to determine the amount of heat in your nut. And calories, which is heat, is equal to mass of water in kilograms. Notice that's kilograms times the delta T times the specific heat of water. And that number is right here. This goes right there. Hold on, I'm in a Word document so I can do this. This is the number you put in there, this. Delta T you'll calculate and the mass of the water you'll weigh or you'll, I'll show you how to get that. And experimental procedure, why isn't this down there? Here's what you would be doing. Now we're using more water than what she does. 200 milliliters, which is 0 0.200, three significant figures, kilograms of water. Now, if you were in the lab, you would be weighing the mass of the water is this way. You'd measure the initial temperature, and here's your final temperature. And you're going to have to calculate delta T, and that's number one minus number two. Next, you'd weigh the holder and the nut is this temperature. And then after it burns and the flame goes out, you'd weigh the holder and the nut residue. And the difference, three minus four, number five, is the weight of the nut consumed. And you'll use your uh, formula, uh, formula A with the data, use the values in red. Dr. White's made it real easy. This is formula one. And by the way, specific heat is 1.00 cal per kilogram. I'm gonna sneeze, hold on. <laughs> Excuse me. That felt good. But anyways, and you'll calculate the calories of your nut. Now, if you look at most packages, you'll see it's normally calories per gram. And how do you do that? You divide number six by number five, and that will give you how many calories per gram. And then here, you'll have some questions. And one of the things I do ask is, when you look at your number, if it's not exactly the one that the company planters peanut gives, what causes the difference? Otherwise known as what errors there are. And if you think about it, let's assume this is a pop can and you have your flame here. How close is that? And also, what other things did you measure? How accurate were you? And I just gave away the answer to the question, or at least helped you on the road to doing it. And whenever you look at any food label, ooh, let's do one. Everybody see Doritos nacho cheese flavor. 
And by the way, on Sunday, Dr. White overdosed on this stuff, watching the Super Bowl. Yes, I had junk food overdose. And if you notice one ounce of that, 28 grams is 150 calories. Oh no, I shouldn't have shown you that. That's sad, it should be lower. It should be 15, I wish it was. But anyways, how did they do that? Well, they measured just like we did. And by measure dividing your calories by the weight, you can get how many per gram. And if you multiplied it times 28, you'd see if this number was right, if we did Dorito chips. Now, you'll be doing that lab. That lab is not due today, it's due next Thursday. So you got a lot of time to do it. You don't even have to go on lab Z. If you want to try and play with the calorimeter, I did and I was having difficulties with it. Now, if you look at PDF 90, you'll see they use Delta H, which is another measure of heat, but they're doing sucrose, which is table sugar, and they don't have you convert to calories and it doesn't make it real world. Mine does. Thank you, Dr. White, you're welcome. And you should have some fun with it. Now, I should mention the first time I taught this lab, which I had never done as an undergrad where I went to school, we didn't do that. Uh, I was shocked how big the flame was from a peanut. And even a corn chip, the flame from there is pretty big. I'm talking about, it scared some of the students. And I actually had to tell anybody with long hair, which I don't, by the way, when I was in college, my hair was down to here. And yes, I had a ponytail. Don't think about how I look with a ponytail. Oh, I see some people are thinking that. But anyways, uh, I had to tell some of my students, make sure even if you have a ponytail, don't get too close to that flame because your hair is flammable. By the way, that's a chemical property. Oh, I snuck that in quickly. But the flame from when you do that is amazing. It made me thought about uh, something I was a hobby of mine way back. And that is uh, being a survivalist. What if you had to leave your house for three days and survive on your own? First of all, this is good practical advice. I hope all of you have a bug out bag. A bug out bag is if you had to leave your house right now, immediately, whether other reasons and live outside your house for three days, could you? You have water, food, way of making fire and also gathering wood to make fire. And how do you make fire? Well, one of the things is to have something that helps start a fire. And the old survivalist trick is take cotton, put some Vaseline, Vaseline is flammable, so is baby oil and keep that in a Ziploc bag in your bug out. And after this lab, I thought, well, you could also put peanuts and corn chips. You could either eat the peanuts or burn them to start a fire. And it works quite well. Luckily, I have not had to bug out. All right, any questions about the lab? All right, time for Dr. White to do an experiment with you people. As I said earlier, one of the things that we I miss, and maybe you miss too, is the fact that you really don't interact with your colleagues. So we're gonna do something to try and alleviate that missing aspect of this course. In Zoom, we have what's known as breakout rooms. And about 30 seconds or a minute, I'm gonna be sending you to different breakout rooms. I'll have five of them and I'll just go alphabetical. And when you get in a breakout room with your colleagues, if you can, turn on your webcam. If not, well, don't. Turn, off your, turn on your mic. If you don't have a mic, you can use chat. When you're in the breakout room, your chat in a breakout room only goes to the people in the breakout room. And what I'd like you to do is say hello to the people you're with. Everybody go around and say a little about you. You don't have to tell any personal information you don't want to. Uh, yesterday, I did it at the other class and one student started going, hi, I'm 22, I'm this and this and this. I said, you know, you really don't have to put your age, but she did and so, and you know, what's your major? Maybe where, what area of the state do you live? I live in Schaumburg, 
if you want to give that, don't, you know, anything you want. And this way, if you want to exchange contact information so you can form groups, that's fine too. And I'm going to do that. Let's go about 10 minutes. I'm going to not sneak in. I'm going to join a couple to get to know you. I won't have time to get to everybody today. But if this works out well, we'll do it more often in labs because in a classroom setting, I only have so much time. But here, if you look at it, it's not even 10 o'clock. And you're supposed to be with me until 10 to 12. We'll get out early. You're not going to stay there. After about 10 minutes, I'm going to ask you to come back. And if you look at the lower right hand, when you're in a breakout room, one of the choices is leave the breakout room. I think it just says leave as opposed to end your session in Zoom. We'll come back and I'll just get a, ask a poll of all of you whether you enjoyed the experience or not. So let's do that. I'm going to start assigning breakout rooms. Hang in there. All right, I'm going to open all rooms. You go to it and then say hello to everybody. Socialize. All right. You should be in a breakout room or you could go to it. Yeah, I just got about everybody. Here, I'll share the results. Can you see that on your screen now, the results? And it looks like overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly people like the breakout rooms. Most of you. All right. I guess some of you, have you found out about what's the uh, last semester's class? What's the app on your cell phone that you can form a group? Is it Snapchat or something like that? And we actually had about 10 people from my class that formed their own Snapchat group. And they're actually emailing each other, chatting during my classes, which is fine, you know, and, and anyways, but it looks like everybody, it worked out fine for you. And we'll do it again. So any last questions before I say we're done for today? Going once, twice, let me see on. With that, well, I'm done for today. Remember on Monday, I'm gonna go through in class so we get it all done before um, the test. I'll do the problem set for chapter four. And I see all of you are communicating. I'll stay open for a little while in case you're still chatting back and forth. Uh, but anyways, uh, don't forget Monday, I'll be doing my world famous review next Thursday, is not Thursday, Wednesday. I used to teach this last semester, Tuesday, Thursday, got, no, that's a lab day. We'll be, you'll be having test number one, do the practice problems, they'll help you. And don't forget, there's a lab due today, but if you get it in tomorrow, that's okay too. And with that, I'm done. Have a nice rest of the weekend, weekend, stay warm. And Dr. White is about to say, gang gesund, goodbye. 
I'll stick around if anybody has a question or anything, comments, whatever, for a couple more minutes. So with that, you can log off. Gang Gazun, goodbye. Anyway, yes. I was wondering, do we have to do the com heat of combustion sugar assignment no. too? No. I, in the and I put it in the um, assignment, some message. That was a sort of a reference. This whole semester, uh, none of the uh, beyond lab Z PDFs, do you have to do anything in there? I will write my own lab. Okay. Yeah, I did the 365 one that was on the second lab. I and it, all, all the labs, I will write my own lab. And that's the only work. I'm showing you the PDF. So in case you're wondering how to, sometimes they'll explain how to operate some of the equipment. Uh, so far, you really haven't had to look at them, but they're there for in case you want them. And that's a good question. Anything else anybody have? I can email you about this too, but I was just wondering like why I got the grade I did on my lab. All right. Uh, why don't you email me and I'll take a look at it because on this machine, I have two machines and don't ask me why, but the re uh, I have this one I use for Zoom and the other one I use for grading, even though I have it, I'm going to try and change that sometime this semester, but that's just the way it evolved. Email me and, and then maybe uh, also we can meet in my office hour, okay? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, you can leave. Or you're just like looking at my pretty face. <laughs> Dr. White's in a good mood. All right. Any last questions before I log off? Bye now. I'll do a any last ones? Going once, going twice. With that, oops, excuse me. I'll say goodbye. I'll see you on Monday and I'm gonna log off. Bye now. <laughs>